Listen, it's not the clothes that make the man. It's the man that makes the clothes. It's the woman that makes the clothes. Who are you? You don't set your identity in somebody else's label. You think that I'm going to feel cheap because I got on a cheap suit? I am not what I'm surrounded by. Your identity comes from within. It comes from within. Stop disguising yourself in somebody else's identity. And don't get yourself killed because you're wearing somebody else's identity. And, and let me say this to you. Don't just do you. Do the person God designed you to be. Do the person God designed you to be. Do the person God designed you to be. Here's why. When you do you, you become selfish with no regard for others. When you do you, you don't care how your actions affect anybody who loves you. When you just do you, you're not called to live in this world and just do you. You're called to do the image of who God has designed you to be. When you do the image of who God has designed you to be, then you experience contentment and then you bless others. You bless others, you become an instrument of blessings. God didn't call us to live selfishly. You're designed to be a blessing to somebody else. You're blessed to bless, you're given to give, you're fed to feed, you're, fed to feed. you're taught to teach, you're comforted to comfort. Whatever God has done for you and to you and in you, he then wants to do through you. It's not just about you. Well, I just got tired of being with my family. I just wanted, I just had to do me. No, 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 you're saying that you just wanna live selfishly. And yet you, you want to, to come away from your God design. Your God design is that you were placed in the earth to be a blessing. You, everything that God has ever created, he created on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. You were created for purpose. Lay your hands on your chest. Say, I'm created for purpose. And let me just tell you this. Think of yourselves. The Bible says that we are the trees of the Lord. We are the trees of the Lord. The trees of the Lord. Trees bear fruit. Have you ever seen an orange tree eating oranges? Or a peach tree consuming peaches? Or a, a watermelon vine consuming watermelon? No. You're not designed to eat the fruit that you produce. Wouldn't that be silly for the peach tree to have some kind of branch coming out and just snatching the peaches off and it just reprocessing, taking it down to its roots and then consuming it all over again? No, no, no. It's designed for it to be given. Your fruit that you produce is for others. What you need to eat is from somebody else producing what you have. That's why God will use you to pray for somebody else and God will answer that prayer and you'll be struggling for yourself. He'll use you to prophesy to somebody else and then you'll be struggling trying to get a word yourself. He'll use your hands to bring healing to somebody else and then your back will be hurting. Your knees will be out. You'll be Ill dealing with digestive. Anybody know what I'm talking about in this place? It is because the fruit that you are designed to produce is not to feed you. Don't do you. Trust God to do you. God says, look at the birds. I take care of them. Look at the flowers. I clothe them. I can clothe you. I'll feed you. Stop doing you. Do who God wants you to be and be used as an agent of God to say, I am an instrument in the hand of God designed to bless. You're a blessing. I'm looking at a blessed people. I'm looking at a blessed people. I'm looking at givers. I'm looking at servers. I'm looking at somebody that's a gift. A gift is not a gift until it is given. A gift is not a gift until it is given. A gift is not a gift until it is given. You're designed to give yourself away. Give yourself away to say, Lord, use me. If you can find anything in my life that is usable, use me for your glory. I dare you to pray the prayer. God, make me a blessing to somebody. I dare you to ask God, say, Lord, use me. Use me until you've used me up. And I tell you, the happiest people that I know are giving people. The happiest people that I know are serving people. And the meanest people in the world, the most unhappy people in the world are self-consumed, egotistical, self-centered people that are just trying to serve themselves, living under themselves, and not concerned about how any of their actions affect anybody else. Don't do you live for somebody else. That's how you live on purpose. 
You have to give yourself. A man gives himself for his family. A woman gives herself for her husband, for her children. Live for somebody else on purpose. Stop living for the aggrandizement of your own flesh. You were not here just to be happy. You're here to be a servant in the hand of God. And your happiness comes out of your making yourself a servant of God. Be the person God designed you to be. You're designed to do great things in the world. You really are. You're designed to achieve. When you achieve, whether in the world of business, if you achieve in school, if you achieve in athletics, when you become an achiever, you become a threat. When you become an achiever, you become a threat. If you become an achiever in government, if you become a, an achiever in the political world, if you become an achiever, you become a threat. And when you are a threat, you become a target. When you are a threat, you become a target. You become a target. And you never know what it's like to be in a targeted position until you're there. And this is why I, I, I give this piece of advice. Never criticize a person who has fallen from a height that you have not yet climbed. You never criticize a person who has fallen from a height that you have not yet climbed. And I just want you to realize this principle, that much of what you become in life depends on whom you choose to admire and emulate. Much of what you become in life depends on whom you choose to admire and emulate. And you look in, around in your life and say, who, who, who do I admire? Who do I admire? Because who, whomever you admire, you will secretly emulate. You have to be careful about whom you admire in your life. I want you to notice Micaiah who was a true prophet of the Lord, when he spoke truth to power, it got him in trouble. You can think, you know, if I tell the truth, you know, God's going to be with me, he's got my back, and he's going to protect me. Sometime when you stand up for truth and for right, all hell will break loose in your life. Uh, I want you to notice here, Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 20 through 26 in the Message Bible. Notice this. And that's what happened. God filled the mouths of your puppet prophets with seductive lies. God has pronounced your doom. Just then Zedekiah, the son of Kenaanna, uh, came up and slapped Micaiah in the face. This is a prophet of God, gets slapped in the face. He, and, and he says to him, since when did the Spirit of God leave me and take up with you? Slap the prophet of God who told the truth. Slap the man in the face. And then Micaiah, now you know if the, if the man got slapped for telling the truth, don't think that you slapped somebody who's telling the truth that they're not going to tell some more truth. And so now they start telling them some more truth. They said, Micaiah said in verse 24, you'll know soon enough. You will know it when you are frantically and futilely looking for a place to hide. It sounded like a threat to me. And the king of Israel had heard enough. He said, get Micaiah out of here. Turn him over to Ammon, the city magistrate, and to Joash, the king's son, with this message, king's orders. Lock him up in jail. Keep him on bread and water until I'm back in one piece. The man not only got slapped for telling the truth, he got locked up and was told to only feed him bread and water. Now you tell the truth and then you get slapped in the face and then locked up. That's what happened to the prophet. Now, people is like, you do good to somebody, you, you speak for truth, you stand for righteousness, and you end up slapped in the face and locked up in prison. I mean, why, why, why? Have you ever noticed that when something apparently bad happens to your life, our little minds start trying to figure out, why did this happen? Why did this happen? You, Lord, what did I do? You know, if we get sick, we start taking inventory. Lord, have I mistreated? Am I holding on forgiveness? We, we start going down a, an inventory list because we just feel like we have to have a reason for every bad thing that happens in our life. God, what, I mean, if somebody breaks up with you, you know, you know, oh God, was it, was it something I said or something I failed to do? And we're just trying to figure it out. There are three reasons that things happen. Three. There are not four, there are only three. How many are there? Three. There are three reasons that things happen. Number one, things happen to you for doing right. You do right, sometimes bad things will happen. 
Things will happen to you for doing right. Micaiah was doing right. He told the truth. He got slapped in the face and thrown in jail for doing right. I mean, the, the police, one, one time my, my wife was driving, I was sitting in the passenger seat. And he pulled her over for speeding. She was probably speeding. <laughs> then he came up to me on my side of the car and he asked me whether my seatbelt was on or not. I started to get smart, like, did, did you see it on? I mean, it was on when he came over to my side of the car. Because I'm the bishop, though, I told the truth. I said, no, I didn't have my seatbelt on. You know, he gave me a ticket. I looked up toward heaven. My license got revoked. You know, I mean, I paid the ticket, but somehow they didn't have record that I had paid the ticket. And I found out that there was a warrant out for my arrest for telling the truth. I told the truth. And I had a warrant out for my arrest for telling the truth. Things happen for doing right. Number two, things happen for doing wrong. You do wrong, of course, there's a consequence. You, you, you reap what you, what you sow. So things will happen, bad things will happen to you for doing right, bad things will happen for doing wrong. And here's number three, how, how many reasons are there? Three. There are three. They, they happen for doing right, they happen for doing wrong. And number three, they happen for no apparent reason. I mean, what did Job do? Job went through months of a terrible ordeal. All 10 of his children died. He lost all of his crop. Sores broke out on his body. He didn't do anything. He, he did nothing. It wasn't because he did something right. It wasn't because he did something wrong. Job didn't do anything. If this was some demonic thing that was happening in his life. Sometimes the devil is just busy, just, you know, I mean, he just messing with your, your spouse and, and your child and, all, and the devil is, it, it's just, no, and it's like, God, what did I do to deserve this? Some things happen for doing right, some things happen for doing wrong, and some things happen for no apparent reason. You can't even figure out why this happened. So here, the prophet Micaiah, he's telling the truth and it winds up getting him slapped and then thrown in prison on a restricted diet, just bread and water, bread and water. Now all of the other prophets, there were a team of other prophets and all of them had lied and told the king exactly what he wanted to hear. Only Micaiah spoke the truth of the word of the Lord. Now here's the deal. The king's got all of this council of prophets on him and everybody else was telling him good stuff. And sometimes when things sound too good to be true, it's probably a lie. And it was in this case. And the one man who told him the truth, he said, I don't even want to hear from this guy because this guy never has good news for me. And sure enough, I mean, it was a bad prophecy, but it was the truth. It was the truth. But here's, my, here's the deal. If your enemy is the first person to tell you the truth, you don't have any friends. If your enemy is the first person to tell you the truth, you don't have any friends because friends tell their friends the hard truth in love. They tell them the hard truth. I mean, I would rather that you provoke me with truth than pacify me with lies. It is interesting. But here all of these were prophets and all of the other prophets had a lying spirit in them. This is what you call prophet lying. True prophets prophesy, but fake prophets prophet lie. They prophet lie. They prophet prophet lie. So what do you do when people in the name of God reading the same Bible that you're reading and they look at you and prophet lie? And somebody is telling the truth. You know, I mean, when they're saying somebody, you know somebody's wrong when people are saying opposite things. Somebody's wrong. Somebody's wrong. But this is one reason why the people of God need this one thing, discernment. Discernment is the mark of maturity and dependence on the Lord because God is our discernment. God is our discernment. Do you know that's what got the, the Adam and Eve kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Because the tree that they ate of, it was a tree of discernment, of the knowledge of good and evil, a distinction that was discernment. They, they ate fruit of discernment. What was the sin of eating that? Because God was their discernment. And this was an attempt to replace God in their life. 
It was an attempt to place God. That's what the sin of secular humanism is. It is an attempt to replace God in our life. And it makes man God. Because he said, you eat of this and you will be like God. They were already like God. They were made in his image and after his likeness. See, the devil is subtle. He's a liar. He really is. But discernment is a mark of maturity. We need discernment. So what do you do when you've got some prophets that claim to be prophets of God and there's prophet lying and then the other prophets are prophesying? You need discernments. We are not called to use the word to divide, but to rightly divide the word to help produce unity. I want you to get that. We are not called to use the word to divide, but to rightly divide the word to help produce unity. We're called to, to, to for a unified body. Jesus prayed uh, in St. John 17, Father, make them one, unify them, make them one even as you and I are one. He talked about it in Ephesians chapter 4, that, that, that we pray that, that God would bring us into the spirit of unity, in the bonds of peace, the spirit of unity. The spirit of unity. Listen, there's one God, one faith, one baptism. You know, that's just one Lord, one Lord. And he wants us to come into the unity of the spirit. Be unified in our spirit, even if we don't come into the unity of the doctrine. But the unity of the spirit to say that we are all children of God. And we use the word of God to unify, unite the people of God. There is not strength in numbers. There is strength in unity. There's strength in unity. You don't want to just get big numbers and then everybody's against each other. The strength is in unity. The strength is not in teams of prophets. Here was Micaiah against all of the other prophets and all of them were wrong. There's not strength in great teams of prophets. There is strength in truth. Only one of them told the truth. I recently read this uh, ad that the New York Times placed. They weren't placing it for any other company. They placed it concerning truth. This is a New York Times that I read about two weeks ago in the New York Times. This is what they said. The New York Times, they put, put this, they took a full ad in their own paper about truth. And this is what it said. It says, the truth is hard. The truth is hidden. The truth must be pursued. The truth is hard to hear. The truth is rarely simple. The truth isn't so obvious. The truth is necessary. The truth can't be glossed over. The truth has no agenda. The truth can't be manufactured. The truth doesn't take sides. The truth isn't red or blue. The truth is hard to accept. The truth pulls no punches. The truth is powerful. The truth is under attack. The truth is worth defending. The truth requires taking a stand. The truth is more important now than ever. The New York Times posted that in their own paper, not advertising for any other company, about the importance of the truth. It's interesting what God can do when we submit our hearts to him. There's another story that is told in 2 Chronicles 35 where this king went into battle unadvisedly. And it wasn't even his battle, but he jumped in the battle because he wanted in the battle. And he got in the battle and he says, listen, the other king told him, he says, this, this is not about you. You don't have any, you don't have any a dog in this fight. But he just wanted to fight. He got in, he disguised himself just like this other king. Second Chronicles 35. He got in the fight himself. And somebody sent an arrow in there and struck him and he was mortally wounded and died later that evening himself. We learn from that you need to choose your battles wisely. Choose your battles wisely. Why? You don't fight an enemy who is not your assignment because it's a, it's a distraction from your real enemy. You, 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 can't, you can't jump into every fight. It's not your assignment. That means that you're going to be distracted from your real enemy. Enemies attack anybody who's dressed for the role, so don't take it personally. If you're dressed for the role, they, they're going to come after you. But I just want to remind you that being in God's will is the best protection that you can ever have. Being in God's will is the best protection that you can ever have. And listen, I want you to get this principle very clearly. That when you run from the fight that you were born to fight, you're going to face a fight that you're not prepared to fight. It happened to King David. 
King David was supposed to be in battle. Instead, he was out there on his, on his balcony looking over at porn. Bathsheba porn. And when he was not where he was called to be as a general fighting, leading his army in battle, he was born for that. When you run from the battle that you were born for, it causes you to face a battle that you're not prepared for. And he wasn't prepared, he wasn't prepared to handle the battle with Bathsheba. And, and that, it, it cost him. It cost him severely. God judged him as a result of that. And it brought war in his home as a result of that. Because he had an innocent man who was loyal to him killed and God says, this will not happen. And God sent Nathan the prophet in there and he says, you know, the sword will not leave your house. You kill an innocent man, what you sow to the wind, you reap in the whirlwind. Whatever you do to others, you better watch out because it's coming back to your family. That's why it pays to do right. But whenever you leave your kingly position and go in disguise, you will face trouble. You will face trouble. And your deception is the onset of your destruction. You see, whenever you have people in an honorable position and they don't want to be recognized, they're generally up to no good. I mean, if you find a man or a woman of God and they don't want anybody to know they're a man and woman of God, they're trying to do something freaky. I mean, you got somebody and uh, they're a deacon in the church. And they're out somewhere and they don't want anybody to know they're a deacon in the church. They must be doing something that's not up to good. You have to be very careful. If you got a saint who doesn't want to be known as a saint, like, shh, shh. Hey, Sister Jack, shh, shh. When you're out doing something and you don't, you, you, you've got to get out of your role. You don't want anybody to recognize you for your role of who you are. It often means that a person is up to no good. But listen, when you get out of your robe, you get out of your role. A change of attire is a change of responsibility. That's why when people get home, they take off. If anybody, I don't know people who work in a uniform and come home and still wear that uniform in their private time. <laughs> if you got to wear a uniform for work, it's like you can't wait to get home. In fact, most people will take their uniform off before they get in the car or on the bus or on the train because, you know, it's like this is my time now and I am finished and I don't want anybody asking me jack. <laughs> so if you wear a uniform when you on your time, Taking that uniform off is saying, I am no longer in this role. I am sorry, you will have to call the main number because this office is closed. <laughs> but did you know that the devil is trying to dress you in the clothes of someone else who has a bounty on their head? But God becomes the defender of those who cannot defend themselves. When you make yourself a child of God, Luke chapter 17, verse 2, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be thrown into the depth of the sea. Because God is the defender of his, of his children. A millstone is a 2,000 pound stone. God says, it's better for you to kill yourself than to touch one of my children. He said, I'm that defender. I am their defender. I want you to notice what Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 says. He says, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are, ab that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden, hidden with Christ in God. That means in order for the enemy to get to you, he's got to come through God. God is your shield. God is your defense. And so, uh, when the devil starts attacking you, you start, you have to let him know, I am not the one. It's like, you can't even see me. Listen, don't post everything that happens in your life on social media. You don't need to be seen. You're giving the enemy bullets to use against you. May I remind you that invisibility is a superpower? Wouldn't it be wonderful? Because you know you can see some people that you don't want to see. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just do something and just make yourself disappear? 
what they, they couldn't even see you. Invisibility is a superpower. It's a superpower. If you could just go invisible. Sometimes God intends for you to be hidden for purpose for the revealing at the right time. Don't try to fight to the forefront when God's got a time for your, he's got a time for your coming out party. Because if they come out before the time, somebody's going to kill you. Somebody's going to target you. God has a time for everything. He has, at times, he's set all things a purpose. For, and there's a time for every purpose under heaven. Your time, your time, God has a set time for your life. He's got a set time for you to be known. He's got a set time for the platform to be yours, for the light to be yours. He's got a time scheduled for you that nobody can stop. And if you just lie there and, and be quiet while, while you're maturing, while God is getting you ready, while he's getting you developed, while he's getting you prepared, while he's getting you equipped, if you just keep your mouth closed and said, God, just do in me, get me ready so that when you turn that light on me, I know how to make it do what it do. If you just said, come on, Lord, just let God get you ready so that when he brings you on the scene, it doesn't take you a, a, a whole long period of time, but once God gets you ready, in a moment of time, God can turn things around and turn it into your favor. It's amazing what God will do. I just want to remind you that God is concerned so much about your destiny. But your destiny must be received. It must be perceived. And your destiny must be achieved. You have to receive destiny from God. You have to perceive destiny. You must understand the destiny that God has marked out for you because if you don't understand it, you won't know how to execute it. So you receive it, you perceive it, and then you achieve it. The three steps of how you come into the destiny from God. There are some people that are trying to be more committed to doing what is right. But the whole deal is not you're trying to be more committed to doing what is right. The issue is that you need to be more submitted to the one who is right. And when your heart comes into proper submission to God, commitment becomes easy. You will always struggle with commitment to something that you've never been submitted to. When you submit yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, committing your way to the Lord becomes easy. Committing your way to the Lord. God's looking for people that will commit to him. He's looking for people that will commit to him. He's looking for people. But there's a bounty that's on you when you put on an identity that is not yours. And he's coming after you. And so you have to realize, I'm not the one. And you say it with your decisions. You say it with everything that is, that is about you. You say it with those things. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.